there's a lot of uh, familiar faces around here. So uh, I'm just going to start off with looking for this. Uh, so I basically got introduced to the power story when I was six years old. And so I lived in a normal house uh, with my parents. Um, but we had a garage. And in this garage, we had a huge gaping hole in the ceiling. No one really knows how it got there. We're pretty sure... Uh, no. <laughs> We're pretty sure the guy before us... Uh, put it there by accident um but anyway it was a, it was always a source of like interest for all my friends so all my friends would want to come over and be like oh what's in this hole and the only way to kind of persuade them that this hole isn't something that they should be looking in was to uh, <laughs> convince them or tell a story that there were scorpions in the hole i'm not sure if it was because i was such a good storyteller or kids are idiots but it stopped people going in a hole the problem, though, then, was that the kids would tell their friends, and then our friends would tell their friends. And then soon, er soon enough, everyone in the school wanted to see your scorpions. So yeah, be careful with stories, because if they go wrong, you've really got <laughs> a big deal that you can't stop. So just to introduce what kind of we do, or what kind of I do, is copywriting. So for copywriting to work, you have to engage people. And the only way you're engaging people is with your writing. So it's kind of a science because you have to look at how your words are going to affect people and how, um, how they react and test things. So if, if something works, sometimes you don't really know why, but things do work and things don't work. And you just have to kind of go with what you're doing and test and test until you've got something perfect. Um, so we have a lot of persuasive techniques to do this, to engage people and to kind of persuade them to like you <laughs> is the thing that we do. Um, you can't see it here, but there's lots of other writing on it. <laughs> the main point is the best way we can do this is with stories. Everything else as a persuasive technique is kind of a push tactic. So you're trying to influence them by saying, oh, we're the best and you need to buy this. But if you pull a use a pull tactic, basically you're you can imagine it as you're a magnet and you're trying to draw people towards you with your stories. So when they start coming towards you on their own being because they've heard about the things themselves, it's much more powerful because people are then kind of persuading themselves. They've already made their idea up about you and you just have to kind of finish it off then. So what are stories? Um stories are basically uh, descriptions of events. So stories uh, consist of a character, uh, a conflict, and then a resolution. This is a basic story. So you can make a story about anything. Um, it kind of, the power of the story is that you can kind of simulate an experience for someone. So someone who's never done that thing before, you can put it into context for them, and so they can understand why someone did something that way and the emotions that kind of ran through them to make them think how they think. Um, so once upon a time, 400,000 years ago, uh, was about the time when people were starting to gather around campfires to cook their food. And with this, uh, a culture emerged where people would explain their experiences of the day, the saber-toothed tiger that they fought off, the mammoth that they didn't quite catch because they're huge and who wants to eat a mammoth? So these kind of stories then ingrained in us because it's been such a long time that people were doing this for, it it came a part of the culture. And people realized this. Like people who wrote the religions, they made sure that every single every single religion that you'll see, they have a big storybook with it. They don't have a book just telling you don't kill people. They have a book telling a story of what are the consequences of this person killing this person, and how will that react? Uh, how will that come on to you? Uh, what's interesting, though, is because of stories. Stories were basically the greatest part, uh, greatest thing for getting your information out, because people would understand it, and then they'd keep it going. They'd tell their next generation. They'd tell their friends, and this was the power of the stories again. So because of this, we have um, a big science called geomythology. 
So geophilic mythology is basically the study of uh, old stories that relate to earthly events. So a tidal wave, an uh, island that got sunk by a, by a tidal wave, uh, or volcanoes, you know, where fire filled the air. And because of this, there's a, a Aboriginal tribe um, in Australia, uh, and they reviewed, um, interviewed, sorry, one of these uh, elders, and they interviewed him about some of his old stories in the area. So he told of this smoke cloud coming in one day, and people from the from the village would go into this smoke cloud and get burned alive. And people were like, whoa, that's a, that's a crazy story. Why is this? It turns out that in this exact area, about 7,000 years ago, there was a volcano which spewed out a hot ash cloud. And this would have killed people on site. As soon as they touched it, they would have burned. And because of stories, this eyewitness account was then able to be retained for people to remember for 7,000 years, which is incredible. So what stories are and what they are not. This is what's happened now. So we kind of are in a state of information overload. So people have too much to think about. And so all the information is just getting thrown onto the fire. People don't really know what to do with it. So with a decent story, you can put those facts and that information into a context which people would then be able to react with and understand and then use themselves. So they can, you can put your information in a form that actually people understand. And you can fight your arguments from both sides. You're not looking like you're trying to say it from one side and influence someone. You're kind of just saying how it is. And people then infer their own meaning from it and convince themselves. So stories, to make them good or make them uh, interesting for people to then share, you need to have unexpectedness. So you have to get their attention in the first place. Uh, what copywriting does a lot of the time and what people are kind of using too much is this process called interrupt. So people are just interrupting someone one time with, say, you can do it really well if you just use someone's name. If you've ever heard your name being called out, you'll stop immediately, look, oh, it's not for me, and carry on with your day. But this kind of interrupt, advertising agencies and everyone, they're using it so much now that you're kind of becoming more and more numb to this. So it's okay to use unexpectedness, but you have to follow it up then. Um, concreteness. So you need to make the story tangible. Uh, so this, to do this, you kind of need people to really be able to feel it, uh, to taste and smell, to understand what this information is. So a good example is to give something that people understand in their context. So for instance, this bag of popcorn contains the same fat content as a Big Mac meal, an English breakfast, and a steak dinner all together. Now, now you can understand how much fat is in that popcorn. You probably won't have popcorn next time you go to the cinema, right? Credibility. So you can do this with people that are already authority figures. So you could do this with a doctor or with someone who's already proven themselves. This is kind of why books like Tim Ferriss's uh, On the Shoulders of Titans works, because people want to know about the people who have done it before, because it's already credible, because you've already seen that they've done it this way. So then their story is more relevant to you, because you're like, well, this is a good story. But the thing with credibility is it needs details. So to have details, you need people to be able to compare the information for themselves. And the only way to do this is to give them a way that they can understand. So if you said three billion people suffer from poverty in the world. You, most people can't put this in context. They don't understand three billion people. So you can't test that yourself. You can't say whether that's a credible fact or not. You just kind of let it go. It's not really interesting for you. But if you said one in three people suffer from poverty in the world, then you can start summing that up and you can test this yourself. And if it comes out, one in three people, oh yeah, oh she is poor then you can start thinking, okay, the rest of the story has got credibility and it'll take off more. So emotional is getting people, yeah. 
actually, passion isn't something that's emotional. Passion, you can have as much passion as you want, but if someone doesn't actually feel the emotion for your topic, then they're probably going to lose that topic. If you can engage them with some sort of, well, here's this is from the New York Times of things that got shared. So the most, the ones that got shared the most were anxiety, anger, and awe, and practical value. So people would share this stuff, but people don't share sadness. People don't want to share the emotion of things that make them sad. So if you're writing something, make sure you're not making it too sad because people don't want to share that. People don't even want to hear about it usually. And simplicity. So if you're going to write a story or a parable, make it about one clear thing. With one clear uh, point, people will then be able to latch onto that when they want to make their point. So, yeah. This is an example of the WWF campaign with a story, uh, emotional, unexpected. It's, it's got everything here. So n from this, because of how humans can comprehend and make uh, inference, seven words lets you know that story. Don't let this be my last selfie. That's a story, because you've got, even in seven words, you understand what that's saying. You're saying, okay, I'm a lion. My conflict is that I'm endangered. I'm probably going to die. Uh, my resolution would be help us with sending your tweets to this. So I'm not talking about huge epic stories. To write a huge epic story, you have to kind of think about Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. This works because you're always keeping people in suspense. You're always giving them like an emotional roller coaster which they'll follow through. So this is a good formula if you want to write a huge epic novel. But really, an epic novel is never going to have as much impact as, say, just a small story. So how would you do it? Um, you choose what your story is going to be about. So say you are a CEO and everyone's saying, OK, we need to move first. We need to move first. We need to get our technology at the forefront of this. But you as a CEO, you, you don't want to. You, you want to stay back a little bit. You want to see what other people are doing. So everyone's telling you, come on, the early bird's catching the worm. They're all doing it. You'd have to think, OK, what can I come up against that? So you choose what your story was going to be about. And that was not being the first mover. Then you choose some interesting components for it. So you'd have maybe a character in there. You'd have um, a conflict. Uh, and then you try and pick the resolution that you want. And then you put it all together. So to do this, you could do the second mouse gets the cheese. So from just that, you can make a story. So you can say, OK, the fat mouse was the second in to get the cheese. And you're like, what does this mean? Well, it means the first mouse got the mouse trap and died. So you want to be the second mouse. And from that, people understand the context of it all. OK, so stories you should have would be, you're going to tell them again and again, uh, is a story of who you are. So. You want to tell people in your own terms who you are. And the best way to do this is with a story. So this is why kind of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Walt Disney, they're probably not that nice in real life. But because of the stories you've heard, you kind of build a rapport with them before you've even met them because of who they are. And they've made their story um, fictional because if you realize what they've actually done to some of the work, <laughs> um, then you want to say why you're here. So what do you bring to this meeting? You'll have this over and over. Like You'll have to meet new people all the time. And so if you haven't had a chance to say who you are, then you have to say why you are. And then you can have another story, which are your values in action. So this kind of explains why you are why you are. So. If you have these three stories and you've made them yourself, you can literally be prepared for any kind of situations.
So I want to leave you with one last point, which is a story. <laughs> um, I'd like to tell you to um, imagine that Truth is a girl. So Truth is a girl, and she's on in the winter of uh, St. Petersburg, and it's cold, and she's naked. You know, she's got nothing to hide. She's not shamed. She's just naked, but cold and alone. No one in the village will let her into their houses because she's naked. People don't like to see this. People, it makes people uncomfortable. So, a parable. This guy parable. He picks her up, and he takes her back to his house, and he puts a cloth of story around her, and he says, "Now try again. Go out into the world." So she goes out. But this time, everyone in the houses lets her in, and uh, invites her to eat with them around, her t uh, around their tables. And this is why stories are so powerful. Thank you. Oh no. Questions? Answered. <laughs> no, cool. okay. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the truth is, <laughs> you will always kind of exaggerate the details to get the point across. Um, and that's the joy of the story, because you're not really lying to someone, you're just telling it in a way that makes it better for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's a tricky one. You, you can't really tell a story that is a lie, because you need certain elements of truth for people to pick up on. Because if you uh, don't have any kind of truth in there, say it's raining upwards, um, or you, I don't know, you, miss you meet Mr. Tomness and he invites you to this snowy area, you need something that kind of puts them into that area first. So C.S. Lewis did it with like uh, the wardrobe. So if you can get them out of reality, then actually there's no boundaries to your stories. You, you can literally lie your way through it. But you do have to have some sort of truth in there, otherwise people just won't um, give it any credibility and they won't share it. So. One more. Yeah, so you, you really have to distill it with, um, kind of make it as simple as possible. It is difficult, but um, there's only three points that you really need for a story, which is the character and a conflict and then a resolution. So if you just have a character and a conflict, which would be, I don't know, yourself and this is the point, uh, and then you just, you, you can basically make people, not make, but let people simulate their own experience. Uh, from what you're saying. So if you've, if you've ever been in a situation and you think, oh, if someone else was in this exact situation and I could convince them this way, then the best way to do it is just to tell them a story of your situation and how it made you feel and how you came about uh, and solved it. Um, yeah. Right, yeah, so just, yeah, because yeah, this is the joy of the, si the story. Like, you can really uh, let people simulate their own experience. So they can be there and they're not there, but they'll have the same kind of feeling that you had and the same thoughts that you had. So. Yeah. <laughs> and then... There was actually scorpions there. No, uh, <laughs> it was just what I was wanted to say is once it had started and once uh, it had already like taken off and people had grabbed onto the story, you can't stop it. Like you can say, oh, it's a lie, but people still they believe these stories and they'll keep going with them as long as they can. And this is the problem if they hear a lie, so because they'll grab onto this lie and they'll keep every single fact that you're throwing at them they'll use that fact in their own story. They're not going to 
it's it's really hard to stop them believing what they think they know. Okay. Right. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Thank you so One much. more. Okay. I think probably in the Middle Ages there were more practical uh, stories. So they d weren't so, well, they still exaggerated. So they still had dragons and they still had things that didn't exist as a way to kind of explain away these phenomena that they didn't really understand. And that's why kind of these uh, geomorphology things worked um, and they got stored because people would explain things. In an so the, the sky was on fire. What does this mean? Like people could never really understand that but then as the story uh, not the story but as our science progressed and we understood what happened back then then we can realize oh it was on fire because there was this huge volcano spewing ash everywhere so yeah it's it was always just um back in the middle ages i guess they just used stories the same as we kind of do today although not for the purpose of influencing or selling they kind of used it just to teach uh and survive around here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>